Greetings everyone and welcome to our Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are pleased to have you all here today joining us on this very exclusive web webinar where we will discuss on how to establish a culture of safety excellence. My name is Erza Ivoze and I'm going to be the organizer for today's webinar. Please stay tuned for the next 45 minutes and learn more whether safety culture is an effective tool for sustainability within your organization, how to understand what makes up for your safety culture, and how to ensure that the culture is aligned with your safety excellence strategy. To tell us more about it, we have Mr. Sean Galloway here with us. Mr. Galloway is the president of the Global Consult uh, Consultancy ProAct Safety and co-author of several best-selling books. He is one of the most prolific contributors in the safety industry, authoring over 500 podcasts, 200 articles, and 100 videos. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, feel free to write them in the chat box of your control panel, and Mr. Sean will answer all the questions accordingly. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you will get an insightful information from this webinar. Please, Mr. Galloway, you may start the presentation. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Well, hello, everyone. I'm honored to be here with you, and, and I'd like to share with you in today's webinar. We have an hour to cover an important topic, but I want to share with you five key questions that I found work really well in consulting with organizations, helping them both internally and sometimes with a little outside support, but to help them create a culture of safety excellence. This is something that I've been passionate about my entire career. Our company is 23 years old at the time of this recording, and if you look at the term safety culture, that term itself is 31 years old. The term safety culture first started to become really popular and really used in 1986 with two major events that occurred that really shook up the world. Some of you may remember in January 1986 the Challenger explosion. A few months later, the world unfortunately experienced Chernobyl. With those two major events, people started realizing it's not just the environment of the workforce, and it's not just what an individual does within that environment. That's the conditions versus behavioral aspects of safety. It's the collective beliefs. It's what's common in the organization around those beliefs that shapes the decisions that are carried out in the organization. And based on how those decisions are carried out, the experiences that they have shape and prompt future decisions. Culture really is what's common in an organization. So that's a key thing to talk about and to really understand. It's not about creating a culture of safety. And as you mentioned, we write a lot and we participate in a lot of discussions as panelists and we keynote and give a lot of talks at private and public events. And I still even today see a lot of people that are encouraging companies to focus on creating a culture of safety. And that forgets the fact that we all already have one. Every organization has a culture of safety. Many could be better than what currently exists. So everybody has a culture. So it's not a matter of creating something new because something already exists. There are beliefs that are common. There are decisions, behaviors, experiences that are common. It's key to realize something already exists. Now, how do we improve upon that while still keeping in mind that there will be a history, there will be stories that will continue regardless of our effort unless we purposely address the storytelling in the organization? So I'm going to talk about all that, but at the end of this webinar, you're going to have five key questions to go back within your organization to look at where you're going, where you're at, and to make the key choices along the way to help you improve. So anytime I'm listening to somebody that's uh, an expert or is presenting a topic on something, I'm always curious about what, what, what their biases might be or, or where they're coming from. So to give you just a quick backstory about 
our point of view and where we're coming from. As I mentioned, 1993, our firm was established, and we've always concentrated on four key areas. Now, there's a lot of things we do to support those four key areas, but we have a very strategic purpose. That's one of the things I'm going to be encouraging you to think about your own organization. What is the strategy around your culture? What are the things that you know that you're good at? What are the things that you know that your weakness is that you choose not to try to focus in those areas? Because we can't do everything. A consultancy can't do everything great, and a culture can't do everything around safety. We have to make the right choices. So 23 years ago, the four choices we made is to help organizations with their overall strategy. And I'm going to challenge your thinking today about what strategy is and what it isn't as it relates to safety. So we've done a lot of work, written books on this and everything. The other, of course, is culture, the topic of this, this webinar today. Uh, we've, we wrote one of the first books on how you create a culture of safety excellence, Step by Step. Was published a few years ago. It was called Steps to Safety Culture Excellence, and that we we put in the public domain our methodology that's worked with thousands of organizations. So that's something that it's of interest to you. You can you can get further information either in books or we have a lot of free articles and as she mentioned podcasts and videos. There's a tremendous amount of resources that are going to be available to you at no additional cost. That's going to help you on this journey because the hard work has to be done within the culture. People like myself outside the company, we can advise, we can challenge status quo, we can present new ways of approaching things, but culture change always happens best from within. So obviously safety culture is a key thing that we focused on. Leadership safety coaching, that's, that's where we help the organizations align the leaders, their behaviors, their styles, what their roles and responsibilities are in safety with the strategy, with the direction of the organization. Uh, a common question asked around this is, are your supervisors, managers perceived more as safety police or as coaches in safety? Is it a matter of they need to be excellent at enforcing the rules or is it more discretionary, voluntary things that would help you improve safety and that needs to be coached? And of course, behavioral approaches. My partner is one of the first pioneers to implement what's called behavior-based safety. And there's a lot of good and bad about the average BBS process, but we've created some significant methodologies that are very efficient and focus on delivering real sustainable value. But I wanted you to have a point of view of, of where we're coming from, because we look at culture very strategically. We look at making sure that the organizational leaders who own safety, not the safety department, not the environmental safety and health professionals, the, the organizational leaders, making sure they have the right strategy to shape their injury prevention efforts, but also to shape their culture. Your culture that you have in your organization, again, everyone has one, is the most effective sustainability mechanism you have. When it becomes the way we do things and why we do what we do, you don't need a lot of command and control. That's how things last. And that's why even basic compliance issues, and depending on where you're at in the world and what regulations you, you fall under, even compliance efforts will be met with success or failure because of the culture. The same with advanced efforts. But when you look at an organizational culture, we view this as being something that's organic. Your culture is like a growing plant. If you think of a growing plant, you cannot command the growth of the plant. The plant is always evolving and always changing. What you have to control is the environment. You have to control the climate. You have to control the chemistry that goes into the growth of the plant. We've, we've created some pretty unique and pretty innovative ways to measure the climate and chemistry that creates the culture because your culture is a byproduct. Your culture is a result. You can't manage a result. You have to manage what creates it. So in this webinar, I'm going to show you some different ways that we found and how you can measure and manage the elements that create your culture. But when you think about culture being organic, it's a process. It's always changing. As people recently graduate from different levels of education and enter your workforce, they leave at different times 
of their career. Some people leave early in their experience. They only are with your company for months or years. Others are with them their entire career. People come into your culture midway throughout their career and leave at different times as well. What knowledge is gained, what knowledge is lost. But your culture is always changing. One of the key things that great organizations do when they look at a model like this, they recognize that when they're really great in safety, this is one of the final frontiers, if you will. You've created excellence in safety. Here's my three-part definition of what excellence in safety is. It's very simple, but I hope you find it insightful. Number one, the ability to achieve and repeat great results. So lagging indicators, your incident rates, your cost, will will be a part of how we measure safety excellence for the foreseeable future, but it's very limited by itself. Number two is knowing precisely how you achieved, how you got those results. If you achieve results but you can't precisely point to how they were achieved, that's management by luck, not by purposeful intent. We need to be able to forecast this is what results we should achieve next month, next year. If we can't do that with confidence, how sure are we that, again, those results aren't a byproduct of luck versus purposeful intent? So number two, knowing how you achieve the result. And number three, creating a shared mindset in the organization that continuous improvement will always be possible. I have companies and clients that hire us that we work with They've discontinued, they've stopped using the term best practice. That's a very common term in a lot of organizations, a lot of businesses. We're searching for a best practice, we're adopting our best practices. The reason why they stopped using that term and instead used the term better practice is because they're fearful that if we adopt a best practice, we might stop looking for a better way. There will always be a better way in your company, in your industry, in your part of the world, practices that were acceptable 10, 15, 20 years ago are likely viewed as unacceptable today because we've evolved our thinking. So what's viewed as acceptable versus unacceptable risk in the culture as it matures is going to change. But organizations really striving towards excellence and safety when they find when they feel as though they've reached that point to where it's all about continuous improvement because we're great. That final frontier when they look at models like this is doing what I call guarding the front door. If you have an excellent culture and it's you meet those three aspects of the definition, you continue to get great safety performance. You know precisely how that's achieved and you also have very clear, it's cl it, strong clarity throughout the organization on how to get better. You have to guard your front door. If you hire somebody, somebody comes to work for your company and they have the wrong mindset about safety, the thinking around safety is much different or old compared to where you are today, might that negatively affect your culture? Absolutely. This is why major corporations are taking extreme steps to understand the culture's not just incident rate or strategy of contractors that work for them, because if they bring a group of people that has a negative or a, an old or a poor safety culture into their culture of safety excellence, might it negatively affect it? Absolutely it will. So when we look at this, it's important to realize every organization has a safety culture. Now, when companies are looking at how do we make it better, one of the first things they tend to do is they start with an assessment. Where are we right now? And that's a logical but misguided step. We did this too. This is exactly what we did up until about seven or eight years ago. When companies would call us and they want to achieve excellence in their culture and safety, we would start with a culture assessment. And that was the wrong approach. We changed our ways several years ago when we started looking at and developing a very clear methodology of how you improve the culture. You first have to start with understanding what your strategy is. 
the safety strategy has to support the business strategy, not conflict with it or work against it. It has to be clear, where are we going? What type of culture do we want? Rather than assessing your culture, you'll find beliefs that aren't desirable. You'll find behaviors that are not desirable. You'll find stories that aren't in line with where you'd like to go. But what beliefs, behaviors, stories, if you changed, would really make a difference? If you don't know where you're going, the famous book Alice in Wonderland, the Cheshire Cat said, if you don't know where you're going, then any path will do. You have to know where you're going. And this is where when you start with the strategy, it begins as a hypothesis. Where do we think we could win? Where do, the, where do we think we could add value? What's the culture we think we can really create here? It begins with the end in mind, as the late Stephen Covey pointed out. You have to have clarity. If you had a culture of safety excellence, what would you see that tells you why you've achieved those results? That's that second part of excellence, knowing precisely how. So excellence is defined more by what we observe and what we're doing than just the results we've achieved. So it begins with answering some of the key strategic questions. We outline this in one of our books, but you have to have clarity around the customers that you have in safety. How can you add them more value? What's the narrative? What's the storytelling that you want to have common? What beliefs would be common that would be critical? It begins with thinking about that. Then, only then, should you assess your starting point. Where, what do people currently believe? What are the things we need to build off of? You'll sometimes find practices that are not common practice that you need to build on those strengths. It's not a matter of just addressing weaknesses. It's a matter of sometimes building on strengths. But you have to look at where you're going, and then you look at what your starting point is. How do we get to where we're trying to go? Then how do we create clarity? It's, it's a, a common phrase in English is everybody on the same page? Do we have everybody on the same page knowing precisely what their roles are, what their responsibilities are? Does everybody know what safety means in the organization? Are near misses, close calls? Is that commonly defined? Here's a simple three-part definition for safety. Certainly it's more complex than this, but I like simple definitions. They're easy to remember and align organizations. Safety is number one, knowing the risks. Do your employees know the most important risks they need to pay attention to? Both the types of risks that you only need to take it once and could severely injure you, those are called low frequency, high probability risks. And the other risks that are called high frequency, low probability risks, the things that we do thousands of times and we may not get injured most of the time. That's where a lot of the discretionary parts of, of safety fall into. But number one, do people know the risks? Number two, do people know what precautions to take to control those risks? Number three, are they regularly taking those precautions? Now that's at all levels, engineering, the precautions they need to take, the hierarchy of controls, the guards we need to put in place. Do people know the risks, what precautions to take to control them? Now they're regularly doing that. You have to create clarity in the organization. And then you work on, as I mentioned earlier, the things that shape your culture. So I'd like to introduce the five questions that have been very helpful for me as a consultant to our clients, helping them to achieve excellence and safety. Number one begins with identifying at the executive level because you have to determine where you're going. So you first start asking questions to try to understand, are we on the same page with what we think safety excellence looks like? Here's the dirty truth. Here's the sad common reality. Even of the many of the best safety performing companies around the world I've had the privilege of working with, when we start this discussion, there's several ways we come to this conclusion, but when we start the discussion with the top six, seven, eight senior executives in a company, we ask them what safety excellence means to them, what they would see if they had it, what measurements would indicate that, who's responsible for that. Here's the reality. If you ask seven people at the executive level of most corporations to define that, you'll likely get about five different answers. If the senior team is not on the same page, 
for what we're trying to achieve and what it would look like, how long it would take to get there, how we would know we've arrived and who's responsible. It's no wonder we have so many different cultures throughout a corporation or even a department at a site or functions at a project location when different values and, and their directives cascade throughout the organization. So how is safety excellence defined at the top and also at the employee level within the organization? When people think that safety excellence, here's a 1970s definition of safety, a 1970s definition. Safety means not getting hurt. That's an old definition that persisted for many years. And in a lot of companies, that perception about safety still exists today based on how we've measured safety. If people think safety means not getting hurt, then anything I do that doesn't get me hurt must be safe. And you see situations like this. This is a picture we took in America, a contractor at a location that we were working with. We all left for lunch and this is what we saw as we approached the guy you know, a picture was taken as we walked up to intervene. The individual uh, tried to be creative to get the job done, drove a forklift on the, pack of, on the back of a flatbed trailer. He speared a wooden pallet that's there, and that wasn't quite tall enough. That's a blue plastic milk crate that he's standing on. Now, when we expressed our concern to this individual, you can see the person in the lower left there. He said, but that was my spotter. Yes, quite unfortunate. But we see situations like this. Here's a question to ask whenever you get pictures sent around like this one. What's the most likely thing that's going to happen? Some people say they're going to fall, they're going to get injured. The real answer is nothing. Him and the spotter are going to go home and the company is going to celebrate another day without an accident. Good job, folks. Thus continuing undesirable behavior in the organization and as long as they don't get hurt. We have to redefine what excellence means. So here's a model I'd like to share with you that, that visually conveys how organizations try to strive towards excellence and safety. One of the first things they do over the years is they put in the first pillar of necessary support and that's management's commitment. That's compliance. Those are the things you have to do, and it's a foundation you have to create. But that foundation only gets you partially across. Now, you have to have rules, and you have to consistently enforce those rules. But enforcing the rules doesn't mean just saying something when people disobey. Enforcing the rules is also saying something when people are following the rules. This is what creates safety police, the perception of safety police. They only talk to me about safety when I'm doing something wrong. Just once before I retire, I wish they'd tell me when I've done something right. An employee told me that one time in a culture assessment. We only give feedback when they're not doing what we need them to do, but don't say anything when they are. Now, where we realize the limitations here is when we answer this following question. And think about it in your operations, in your company. Can your employees obey all the rules, follow all the procedures, wear all their personal protective equipment, and still get injured? In most corporations, the answer is absolutely yes. So this is the foundation we have to build off of, but we can't stop there. We have to involve the workforce in the culture. W. Edwards Deming, one of the founders of the modern-day quality movement that started several decades ago, he has a great principle that I learned a long time ago that served me really well in my career. People support what they help to create. How much creative input does the workforce have in the culture you're trying to evolve, in your safety programs that you're deploying? Now, to create stability around this particular level, you have to have focus and you have to have systems that reinforce that focus. Focus, in English it works well, this is an acronym for us that stands for Forming One Common Understanding of Safety. What does safety really mean to the employees? What's their focus above and beyond the rules, policies, procedures, and PPE, personal protective equipment? What are the things they're focusing on and how do we create systems that reinforce it in the absence of those that can do the enforcing, the supervisors, management. 
part of culture is what people do when nobody's looking. That's not a complete definition of culture, but it is a part of it. Now, we have to manage our compliance, but if we want people to go above and beyond, that's where we're focusing on really developing leaders at all levels of the company, inspiring people to do more than what they have to do just to collect a paycheck and go home. We have to build trust between the levels of the organization, and we have to create a very strong sense of teamwork and safety. That's the difference of a committee and a team. If there's politics on your team, if there are winners and losers on your team, that's not a team, that's a committee. But putting people together and calling them a team doesn't make them one either. Do you have a real strong sense of teamwork and safety? Now, in many parts of the world, the regulatory agencies require you to measure your failure rate. And that's what incidents are. We've created our systems, we've put all these things in place, and somebody got injured. It's not that a person failed necessarily, but all the things that we've done failed to protect that individual. But if this is the way we improve safety is just by failing less, that's not motivation to the culture. Think about it, if, if the new year starts and the executives say, all right, everyone, I want you to work harder this year to fail less, that's not a very motivation, motivating message. We have to look at trying to get better by focusing on the performance. What performance creates the results that we're after? We can't just manage compliance. We have to influence performance. So looking at a model like this, consider a discussion in your company, and we have articles on this that can be shared. Where are you on the bridge to safety excellence? Number two, what would be common if you achieved safety excellence? What are the things that you would see, that you would hear, that tells you why you've achieved safety excellence? So here's a model I'd like to share with you that explains how cultures are formed and how they shape and affect new people when they join. One of my opening slides, the pipe, that showed how people come and go at different parts of their career. This explains how they're affected when they join. So starting at the top, people have existing perceptions. Maybe they think it's a good idea to stop a job for a safety concern, or maybe they think it would be supported to volunteer for a safety effort. Those perceptions affect people's attitudes. If I think my supervisor really cares about safety, I'll have a different attitude than if I think my supervisor doesn't care. That affects values, the shared beliefs, but also the real core beliefs to an individual. Now, over time, those perceptions will influence the decisions. If somebody thinks it's a good idea to stop a job for safety concern, and that is a value that's reinforced frequently by examples and not just communication, they'll make a different decision than if they don't think that's a supported behavior. When they decide to act on that decision, which is a behavior, behavior is just an observable act. It's what you do, say, how you say things, and even your work product. But before somebody decides to act on something like stopping a job for a safety concern, they have an expectation of what will occur. Now here's the cultural part that starts shaping this. If I decide to stop a job for safety concern because management continuously reminds me that production's not more important than safety or it's at the same level or it's a value or whatever phrase they use and if it's reinforced to me over and over and over again, if I decide to stop a job for a safety concern and if I have a good experience, most likely I'm not going to tell a lot of people because I expected to have a good experience. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. Now, if I have a great experience, I might tell a few people because I'm pleasantly surprised. It exceeded my expectations. Unfortunately, however, the more negative the experience is, the louder the storytelling in the organization that either confirms or conflicts with the perceptions that exist. This is how cultures shape one another. What's the storytelling in your company? How positive or negative is it? Who has the loudest voice in the storytelling? Are the experiences that you want to have occurring in the organization being shared more 
than something that happened only once 23 years ago. But what beliefs, what perceptions would be common if you achieve safety excellence? What would be the common decisions people would make? What would be the behaviors that you can observe? What would be the stories? Many of these things on the model I'm showing you here today are actually measurable. Some of them are more precise than others, but an imprecise measurement of the right thing is much better than a precise measurement of the wrong thing. Measuring your incident rates, unless you have a tremendous amount of them, doesn't tell you how to get better or prevent them once you only have a few remaining. You have to look at evolving your measurements, and I'll talk to that as well. So here are two different things that we measure with our clients to determine what's creating their culture. Earlier in this presentation, I mentioned that culture is like a growing plant. It has to have the right climate, and it has to have the right chemistry. So the environment that it's in and what you put into that plant will either kill it or will facilitate growth. It's the same thing in safety. If there's a tremendous amount of blame and finger pointing, it's going to kill a safety culture. You'll have a safety culture, but it will be very poor. When you look at the things that create this, and we outline this in our book, Steps, but I also have articles on this that if once you receive my contact information, I'll be more than happy to share the articles specific to what we're discussing here today, as well as some guides on how you can actually measure this within your company. We look at measuring the level of perceived commitment that exists with how employees feel about the commitment to safety, how supervisors, how managers. This is different than a perception survey. Perception surveys tell you how people perceive at that point in time, but they don't tell you whether it's accurate or not, nor do they tell you what's creating the perception, which is so much more valuable than just how people perceive. If you know about a perception but don't know how to change it or continue it, you're at a standstill. So we look at the level of commitment. We look at the level of caring. If people think it's more about the numbers or it's more about the individuals, you could approach any supervisor and they're going to know the first names of all their employees and even their employees' family members because they've taken the time to get to know what's important to those people. What's the degree of cooperation? Are everybody working together as a team or is engineering and operations at continued odds? Or the safety professionals not viewed as respected in the organization? What's the level of cooperation? And how much are we coaching rather than just policing for safety in the organization? Those are things that we measure. And again, I'm happy to share some additional content on this. The other we look at the chemistry of safety culture excellence. How would you rate the current level of passion for safety excellence on a scale of 1 to 10? By the way, that's how we measure this. How would you rate the level of focus? It's very clear. It's laser-like rather than spread all over the place. Are the expectations clear? You could approach anybody at any level and ask them what their most important responsibilities are to both help prevent injuries but also shape the culture and you would get the right answer. A lot of people think the expectations are clear, zero injuries. But if they don't know what's expected of them to make that a reality, the expectations are not clear. Proactive accountability. This is a term to define what accountability is supposed to be about. In many organizations, accountability is a dirty word based on how it's deployed. And it typically sounds like this. We didn't get the results we wanted. Who needs to be held accountable? That's a negative and reactive. Real accountability is proactive. Real accountability is making sure people are doing the things necessary to get the results before checking to see how did it turn out. That's proactive. How is that in your organization? Reinforcement. Are the right things being reinforced after somebody has joined the company, after onboarding, after training. What do people do when the supervisors aren't around? How would you rate the sense of vulnerability? This means that even if we're great in safety, there's always a possibility that I could become injured. You don't have people that view themselves as superheroes or the term bulletproof. It's not going to happen to them. 
How would you rate the degree of communication? It's boundaryless. There's no boundaries in communication. It doesn't get filtered up or down in the organization. The right things get communicated. What about measurement? Does measurement and safety prompt, direct, align, and motivate behavior? Most companies, it doesn't. If I were to ask you what percentage of your employees are super motivated by your safety measurements, would I get more than 10%? And a lot of companies, less than that. Measurement isn't supposed to be just to hold people accountable or even to tell you how you did in safety. It's supposed to motivate continuous improvement. Are you measuring what you want or are you only measuring what you don't want? So there's several ways we've, we've created on how to measure this to determine the true maturity of an organizational culture and also how to improve it. Number three is what is the excellent strategy? Has that been clearly defined? And once you define that, then you start doing the assessment piece we're talking about. Can our culture carry out the strategy? Can we execute on the strategy? Now, when I look at the average strategy that's out there, and I do a lot of engagements throughout the year where companies just hire my team and me to just review their strategy and give them feedback and make any recommendations to make sure they're clearly thinking through this. This is the average strategy I tend to see. There's four parts to it, and we call it the perpetual cycle of avoiding failure. It just continues with the goal of avoiding failure. And here's what it looks like. The company will look at their incident rate, they'll set a new incident rate, goal or objective, they'll develop a list of things to do, they'll do those things, and then they look at their incident rate. How did we do? The problem here is when you actually have improved performance, we fall into a trap that's called correlation causation that most of us know to try to avoid falling into that trap, but we fall right into it. Because we'll say things like, we had improved performance, we were doing these things, therefore, we had improved performance because we were doing these things. Not necessarily. Sometimes we had improvement in spite of the things that we were doing. Sometimes it was just luck. Sometimes it was just what's called normal variation in our performance. It's not about failing less. It's about are we creating sustainable value. Here's my definition for a strategy. Real strategy is a framework of choices, trade-offs, small bets that the organization makes to determine how to capture and deliver sustainable value. Are we making the right choices with our strategy? And some of the choices that have to be made when considering our culture, what are we not going to do? What We can't do everything. What are we not going to do? Now, just an example, because again, we only have an hour for, to cover this important topic. Here's something that we call the goal means flow down. This is a visual example of how a lot of our clients are led to create their strategy to put information in these key pieces. Up at the top, it has to clearly describe the vision for safety excellence. I'm not talking here about a vision statement. I'm talking about what's called operationalizing safety excellence. Consider a department or a site, depending on where you're from and what oversight or involvement you have. Think about a group of people that are together. What would you see that would be common that tells you why you had zero reportable or recordable or major injuries in that particular area? What would you see that would be common? That's part of the vision for safety excellence. Able to get great results, knowing how we got them, and that mindset of continuous improvement. So what would that look like? Then you have to assess the data. Then you have to see where you're at. What does your injury data tell you? Do you have more injuries on certain employment levels, uh, years of employment, age of the employee, type of work that they're doing, department shift? Is it mostly behaviorally preventable? Is it mostly preventable by change in the conditions, a combination of the two? What does your data tell you? Only then should you set your strategy based on data, not opinions. What are the main goals? We need to better hire and onboard our employees. Okay, there's hundreds of things that we could do there. 
We can't do everything. What are the key choices we need to make, and how are we going to measure that what we're doing is creating value? On the cultural side, what do we know about our existing culture compared to where we're trying to take it? What are the key choices we need to make there? Trade-offs, small bets sometimes, if, unless we have good data. That's why we've created some unique ways to measure what creates the culture. So we're making the right choices. And in the middle here, we have to have what's called a balanced scorecard, where we're not just measuring our results, or not just measuring our programs and activities, or measuring how they correspond and how they impact each other. So number four, then on the topic of, of data and measurements, what data do you have that helps you proactively, without injuries, prioritize what you're going to do to continuously improve? Because injuries will give you some insight into the culture, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what to do to change the culture. Do you know the levels of trust? Do you know the level of coaching? Do you know the degree of vulnerability? A lot of companies, if they're really good in safety, they have to create a bit of uh, realization that there's always that chance to get injured. Sometimes people start to do what's called filtering out those low probability risks because we haven't had an injury in years in this department. It's not going to happen here. So sometimes we have to create a healthy appreciation for the risk. But you're not going to get that from your injury data. You have to get data around your culture. So what data helps you shape your strategy to improve safety performance and culture? So I want to walk with you uh, on another little model here that we've created that explains how companies have evolved and what they measure in safety. Most companies in, in most of the developed world, whether it's for their government or whether it's for the clients that they serve, have to report on their lagging indicators, the results, the frequency of types of injuries, uh, the cost of those types of injuries, but they realize that that's very self-limiting. You can't just measure the results there. That's like in finance and the company, you can't just measure how much you made and how much you, lo how much you lost or how much you spent. There's a lot more to it than that. So what companies have done over the years is they tend to stop around leading indicators. Leading indicators are typically measurements of activities. How many observations? How many inspections? How many warm bodies did we have in the classroom for safety training? How many hours of this? How many numbers of this? How many meetings started with the safety share? There's a lot of different things. But this is where we fall back into that trap. We've done more. We had improved performance. Therefore, to continue to improve more, we should do more. Not necessarily. A lot of companies that we work with, because we tend to work with most of the best safety performing ones, and we work with companies at all, all levels of maturity and safety, but you will reach a point in your progress in the journey to safety excellence where more is not the answer. It's by doing things better, by being better focused. This is why there's a measurement that we've created that we call transformational indicators. This is an indicator that measures the contribution of value between your activities and your results. For example, if you train somebody, did they learn anything from it? Did it change behaviors in the organization? If you had a 30-minute safety meeting and you talked about four most important topics, What's your return on attention, ROA? If a month later you ask people if they can name what those four points were and everyone can only tell you two, you got a 50% return on attention. If there are 30 major things people should know about your safety programs, and if you do a quiz and most people can't tell you the most important things regardless of how often you've communicated, you've just discovered your safety IQ. The answer on how we improve the IQ isn't necessarily more communication, it's how do we make it stick in the organization. If we're doing all these things to improve safety, are we changing the perceptions? Are we changing the storytelling? Are we changing the behaviors? If we're trying to really have management and operational leaders take ownership in safety so it's not delegated to the safety department, 
Measure the action plans that follow an incident. What percentage of those action plans are assigned to the safety department versus the operations leadership? That tells you who really owns safety. If you're trying to improve safety and help the employees realize that we're not putting all the responsibility on them, it's shared, measure the the responses, the action items following an incident, what percentage of those action items fall into the standard five levels of the hierarchy of controls? Are we eliminating? Are we substituting? Are we engineering it out? Are we creating administrative controls, rules, policies, procedures? And are we creating personal protective requirements? If the vast majority of our action plans following an incident are in more paperwork and personal protective equipment, well, don't expect our results to last very long because we're truly not engineering it out. And don't expect the workforce to truly believe that, you know, that it's equal share in trying to improve safety. But those are just some simple examples. You have to understand the value between your activities and your results, just like in health. And I have a personal story that someday on perhaps another webinar I'd be happy to share with you. And I've written about it as well in articles and stuff. But if you have never had a heart attack, you've never had a stroke, you've never had any organ failure, it's easy for people to think, I must be healthy. Now, if you're living a healthy lifestyle, you're eating right, you're exercising regularly, and you've never had those lagging indicator events like a heart attack or anything, and you check your blood pressure one day and it's high, the answer isn't more exercise, it's finding the right intervention. Same thing happens in healthcare. Blood pressure, while it is a leading indicator, blood pressure tells you the value from your health activities and choices to your health results. Are you exercising more? Does your blood pressure go down? You're reducing your sodium intake, salt, does your blood pressure go down? You're taking blood pressure medication. Does your blood pressure go down? You're getting into fewer fights with your spouse. Does your blood pressure go down? Your blood pressure tells you the value and tells you why you haven't had a heart attack. That's a key indicator. There's a lot of things to measure in safety, but what data would tell you that you're doing the right things and that you're getting better and that you're progressing, getting closer to what you've identified in your company as excellence. All of this has to fit within a balance scorecard. You can't just measure your results. You can't just measure what you're doing to manage safety. You have to look at how that affects the culture, how that affects common performance, common practice. If we're doing all these things, do our compliance scores go up? If we're doing all these things, are we are we creating more volunteers in the organization? So when we have improved performance, we know why. So I saved the fifth question for last because it's one of the questions that's very difficult for companies to ask and answer as they're looking at their strategy, creating a better definition of excellence within their culture, looking at defining what would be common if they achieved excellence, and then really creating an effective framework of strategy to improve and looking at what data that they're going to look at. The fifth question that they come to is what do we need to stop doing? This is a very difficult question to ask and answer because it's fearful for the safety professional that if we stop doing something, our incidents might come back. Well, there's some validity there. You're right to be concerned about something, but if we're, we're doing things at one point in our maturity and improving safety that don't any don't add any further value or maybe have just become informal in the way we do things we don't need the formality anymore but most importantly if we're doing things that distract us from where we need to go we might need to stop that this is what in english we call a knee jerk reaction a company's charting along they're doing some things to improve safety and they have one incident out of the blue. Nobody saw it coming. It was a black swan event. Nobody, saw, nobody could have anticipated it. Then all of a sudden a mandate comes down that we implement this program and we do these things distracting us off course. One data point doesn't necessarily indicate you have to completely change your strategy if you have a good strategy. If it doesn't add value and if it's not necessary, 
we might need to consider stopping it if it demotivates people. If we're doing things to try to improve safety that people do not see the value of or it's inefficient, if we end up disengaging the very people whose engagement is critical for us to be success, we're not winning in safety. So think about the things that you're doing in safety. What might you need to modify? What are the things that the customers of your safety program which is really everybody in the organization, supervisors, employees, contractors, senior leadership, what are the things that they really need value in? But when you're, and, and how can you provide them that value? But when you're thinking strategically about this, everybody can't be a customer at the same time. Data has to prove what are the key areas that we need to focus on. Companies can't do everything great. They have to choose the, a few things that they can be great at. There's some other things you can start to work at. It doesn't mean you only focus on the most important thing, but you have to spend your energy on the most important thing. This is what I call a one-handed strategy. In safety and even in business, if you have more strategic priorities than you can fit on a single hand, focus is what's needed. Perhaps you've heard the saying, if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. We have to think the same way in safety. What are the most important things that we need to be focusing on? Well, I hope the questions that I've shared for you in this webinar and in this presentation are helpful to think about where you're trying to go in an organization. What would it look like when you get there? What strategy do you have? What strategy is currently deployed within your business, how can you leverage that? I said this earlier, your safety strategy has to support the business strategy, not conflict, hinder, or compete with it. In most corporations, if it's the safety strategy versus the business strategy, we know which one will win. And we see this, we do a lot of work in mergers and acquisitions, and we'll see this as well. Safety is not even considered during what's called the due diligence process, where we're trying to understand everything about the company being acquired. They don't even look at safety, the record keeping, the rates, and certainly not the culture. So they'll acquire an organization, and the transition period is very messy. Sometimes the merger falls apart or the acquisition fails. Safety is not considered during the acquisition process. Or on the other side to that, if the safety strategy is so rigid that there's no flexibility in what's allowable and what's not, then it comes down purely to a financial decision and safety is put aside. Safety can't compete with production. Safety has to add value to it. But we also can't just try to add every possible thing in there to make safety a part of every possible thing that we do. That would be ideal in an ideal world. But there's some things that might not add value that we need to figure, we need to determine whether we need to stop doing it or not. Bottom line, everybody has a culture. Everyone has common beliefs about safety within a department, within a site, within a company. There's common behaviors. Have you ever walked into a different company or spent some time at a different site and you could just feel things different about that? Maybe you've been able to put your finger on it and identify. Maybe you can't. It's just the environment, the climate feels a little bit different. Every organization has an existing culture. How do we make it better? We make it better by thinking very strategically about where we're trying to go, then determine where we're at, and make those difficult choices with senior leaders in the organization, because safety leaders cannot set the safety strategy by themselves. It has to be established with the business leaders because they own safety and they also own the culture. They're going to be the ones that need to carry it out and they're going to be the ones responsible for truly shaping what those priorities and what those values are. I hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, we've put, as you mentioned in the introduction, tremendous content out there that uh, that helps direct organizations and articles, videos, blogs. We do, a, you know, primarily we are a consulting company, so we directly work with companies to help them achieve the things we're talking about. But we put a lot of our stuff in the public domain to help organizations themselves continuously improve their safety culture. I'd like to turn it back over to you and see if we have any questions or anything we can talk about here. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Galloway, for this excellent presentation. Uh, I would like to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services for OSA's uh, 18001 introduction, foundation, lead implementer, and lead audit auditor. OSA's 18001 helps you in reducing your workplace hazards and also protecting the safety, health, and welfare of the people engaged in your workplace. A PCB certificate will demonstrate your dedication in implementing and managing these processes and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. For more information, please visit our website, pcb.com slash training. Now, without further ado, we will read some of the questions uh, from our attendees regarding today's presentation. So, uh, Mr. Galloway, some of the attendees have asked the following questions. The first one was, how can one create a culture of safety in an environment where the top management are less concerned and more focused to business growth? That's an excellent question, and I'm going to give you a very candid response to that. Uh, sometimes you can't. Uh, there are external pressures, uh, uh, government, sometimes the business case for improving the business around safety comes from a change in regulations. Uh, the global world, uh, I've been very, very honored to be a keynote speaker in, in many parts throughout the world and their first ever safety conferences that the, the countries have had. So safety is changing. I, I, my partner and I wrote a book called Forecasting Tomorrow, actually I think it's up there on the slide, where we talk about making some very clear predictions about what's going to happen over the next 10 years and how organizational leaders think about safety and their roles is changing. Uh, we work with so many companies and and again, many parts or many places around the world were CEOs where I would have never anticipated, things I wouldn't have predicted. I'm hearing them say things like, if you're not great at something as important as safety, what else aren't you good at? Safety is an indicator of leadership capability to get important things done. Now, when other leaders' peers are hearing that, their, their colleagues at the same level, that starts to influence them. I've seen in, country, in companies where there's been a change in board members, where a new board member will come, or a new owner, if you will, will come from a different industry that had a more effective approach to safety and really starts challenging that. But if it comes down to that the, an individual owner, an individual leader just doesn't care, well, we have to work on changing their perspectives about safety. It's what I call maturing safety excellence thinking among the leadership team. Sometimes it's in webinars like this. Sometimes it's in articles. Sometimes it's hearing what their peers are doing. But the sad reality, and I'm a very candid person, the sad reality is there will be some people who just don't care. There's two types of people in safety to really make it this simple. There's people that care and there's people that don't care. There are some people in some organizations that you're going to be very limited in your sphere, what surrounds you, and your ability to influence. It, it, you know, if, if this is something you're really dedicated to within that company, it's called what we call fighting the good fight. You have to keep fighting because things evolve and things change. But you also have to pick your battles. There will be some places in the world and some com companies that operate there where cash is king, and that's the only thing they care about. I, too, have been in places where employees have been killed on the job, and when auditors come around, they put an, another employee with the same last name just so the auditors don't catch that they're missing an employee. I've seen some pretty tragic things in my travels and my career, so I, I appreciate where that question is coming from. You have to look at continuously enhancing your ability to be influential and help them be influenced by others. But to be candid again, you have to pick your battles sometimes. Thank you, Mr. Galloway, for your answer. I wanted to first kindly ask you to change the slide to the question mark slide, please. And then we can continue with the second question. Certainly. OK, thank you. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, some of the attendees ask actually, what is the best way to convince top management to implement safety culture in their small company? 
Well, some of it is certainly a cost saving. So what's the best way to to give, convince them? You have to look at answering what we call the what's in it for me question. It sounds selfish, but it's a real question. What's in it for me? So here's what I've done. Here's an exercise you can do with the top managers of a small company. Have a whiteboard and have five sections on that. Or have flip chart paper and, and have five categories. In the first category, write employee. and the second category, write employee's family. And the third category, I'm thinking about this in a small site, the third category, write department. The fourth category, write site or company if it's small. And the fifth category, write you as a leader. Now what I want you to do is I want you to brainstorm with those leaders of that small company and say, if we are excellent in safety, what's the value to the employees? What's the benefit? How do we, what are all the things, the pros, the things that we would win by or succeed? How would we benefit in the department for excellent in safety? What about the company? Sometimes it's by attracting new talent if you know that your site's less harmful than other sites. Sometimes it's they want to avoid the press and the media coverage. But even you as a leader, it's important to help people self-discover what those business values are. But people also respond emotionally to change before they respond logically. So sometimes you have to look at it from an emotional standpoint, what's called altruism. Can they really see that, the, that this is doing things good? It's going to come down often to a cost savings. What's the cost that we can provide savings to the organization, and how can that be reallocated back in to help the organization grow to where we're not hurting people? But incidents also affect quality. They affect employee morale. Those are things that are the employee morale. It's harder to identify cost savings to. That's why it's important to go through an exercise like this and to help them see all the positive benefits that if we have a culture of safety excellence, how does it benefit the employee, their family members, your family members, the department, the site, and you as a leader? Going through that exercise, I think you'll answer that question for yourself. But it's also important to align your expectations with the leader, whether they think excellence and what do they think a culture of safety excellence looks like. If they think that a culture of safety excellence is employees just follow the rules, then you need to help them think differently about safety excellence. You might need to look at your injuries and show them it's not from people not following the rules, it's other things at their discretion. So if we could change what employees do at their discretion, we would be winning more in safety. So how do we go about that? But that exercise of doing what we call answering the what's in it for me question, I'm pretty sure I have an article on that as well, uh, that, that'll be that, that's one of the exercises that I've been helpful with in different companies to help them discover what that business and personal benefit is to being excellent in safety. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. Okay, one other question was, please clarify the issue that you have mentioned of safety adding value as opposed to competing with product. Okay. so. There is a video going around right now, and if you have access to YouTube in, in your community or in your company, look for this video. There's a video of a teacher somewhere here in America. I, I'm, I'm headquartered in Houston, Texas in America, and I don't know where it is in America, but this teacher has kids coming up to his classroom, and this male teacher has created a unique handshake. Sometimes he's slapping high five, he's doing a dance, he's tapping feet together, it's, it's interesting, bear with me, but each student, and there's about 20 of them, he has a unique way of associating with them to say hello when they come into the classroom. You can see in looking at this video that employees are super, I'm sorry, students are super excited about coming to this guy's classroom as opposed to others. Safety meetings, safety departments, the things we're doing in safety, how do we create unique value? How do we create engagement where people want to come to the safety meetings? There was a consultant of an insurance company, I can't remember which one it was, so forgive me, but he said if you had to charge your employees attendance like going to a movie theater, tickets, if you had to charge them to attend your safety meetings, how much would they pay to show up? How can you create uh, 
uniqueness? How do you create an interest where people are engaged? Your safety programs already have a brand. You have to market safety excellence, not the things they have to do, but you have to market it. And part of marketing is creating a brand. But a brand isn't just a logo. A brand is how people associate with a product, uh, a company, or even a person. Your safety efforts already have a brand. What's the emotional response? What comes to mind when people think about safety in your, in your department? How do you change that perception about the value that safety provides them? In many of the, in much of the world, you are significantly more likely to get injured outside of work than at work in the community in and, in and around the homes. Are we making safety portable? That goes back to the employee's family. What's the benefit of being excellent in safety? It helps them everywhere that they are as well. But we have to have people identify that what they're doing affects them everywhere that they are. But how in your safety meetings and your engagements, how do you create something like this one teacher did where when the students go to his class, they want to be there and they can't wait to be there? I'm not necessarily advocating for different handshakes and everything, but you got to be creative. It's not a matter of we need to do more safety than production. To me, that's the same thinking that in business, if you compete based solely on price, you tend to commoditize yourself. Business efforts, what they try to do is they try to increase what's called the market capitalization, the worth of their shares, the worth of their company, and they try to increase market share. Safety efforts have a market share too. The market share that safety, production, all those other things compete with is the attention share of the workforce. What can you do to capture their, their interest, their attention? That's that return on attention measurement I mentioned earlier. But I don't think there's a perfect answer and this is how you do it. That one teacher found a unique way to create interest to where the students wanted to go to his class over others. How do you create that same sense of interest where I want to be involved in safety, I want to be a part of the team? Yes, production is important, but I really want to be engaged in safety. That's a question I want to encourage you to ask and answer within your own organization as well. Okay, because of the time limitation, Mr. Galloway will answer one last question, and the remaining ones will be answered individually through email. Okay, uh, what are some of the documents that a company can use as a guidance when wanting to implement safety culture? How would ISO 45001 help in this case? So some of the documents, the, the publisher of one of our books called Wiley will, will certainly appreciate this, but I would encourage you to read our book, Steps to Safety Culture Excellence. Uh, that's a book that was published in 2013, and uh, I think that uh, that I, I've yet to find a book that completely and clearly outlines a path strategy on how you achieve what we call safety culture excellence. When the publisher contacted us, there's about 12 or 13 other books that fairly well describe the culture, but they don't necessarily tell you how to get there. That's what we did in this book. We clearly said, here's what we've done for hundreds of companies that worked really well and the steps you need to take. So that, that's what I would recommend. If you go to our website, there you can find all of our articles that have been published over several years. There's hundreds of them in there. Uh, we have a podcast site that's uh, I first started the podcast in January 2008, and so there's coming up 500 topics, and you can get them subscribing through iTunes or going to safetycultureexcellence.com. But I, I would encourage you, you do start with that book, and on our website you can download the, the introductory chapter to see if it's something that interests you. Um, as far as 14,001, I think 14,001, I think 18,001, I think they start giving good frameworks but I don't think they address the culture. I think it takes more of a systems approach, which is critical. I think you need to look look at a lot of different ways, but it does not provide you a strategy to shape the culture, in my opinion. I, I think it's very good, and I've worked with many clients that have that continue to be recertified, and it's been beneficial. Uh, I'll, you know, again, I'm as I mentioned, I'm a very candid person. I have other clients with operations around the world that can't point to any real savings or improvement as a result of that. So that goes back to the strategic questions. What do we need to do? What initiatives make sense? What initiatives don't make sense and don't add value? I think adding more 
systems approaches to it and adding more structure can always be a good thing. I do not think that, that by itself it provides you a strategy to, to shape the culture, though. Okay, thank you once again for this presentation, Mr. Galloway. It was an honor having you as a presenter. I would also like to thank all the attendees for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us. Please be reminded that this webinar will be recorded and posted in our YouTube channel and on in our SlideShare account. We hope you have, you have enjoyed our webinar and we wish you a wonderful day. Thank you.